of our attendees. So first, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Christina Kahlberg. I'm the Executive Director of the Diabetes Research Connection, and we are so, so thrilled that you are joining us for our second virtual gathering, and we are excited to have Dr. Vincenzo Cerulli from the University of Washington with us. I'm going to introduce uh, the two others that you see on the screen right now. So joining us is Casey Davis, our Director of Development, um, who has personally invited all of you. You will be hearing from her. She'll actually be closing out uh, our uh, virtual gathering today. But Casey, is there anything that you would like to say as we get started? No, but just for those who are joining um, now, maybe you've been in the first training that we had, the first seminar. This is a webinar format, so it just looks a little bit different. Um, so we can't see you, um, but you can see us. You can see those who are speaking and the panelists. And then you can engage throughout this whole seminar with through the chat feature. So Christina will touch on that. I just wanted to say that because I know this looks different than the last one that we had. And thanks for coming. Thank you, Casey. Um, as Casey mentioned, if you have any questions for Dr. Vincenzo Cerulli as he presents his material, please, at the very bottom is a navigation menu. And there is a chat little feature. It's like a little top head. If you select that and you select to the panelists, if you select it to the panelists, your question will come directly to me and I will be able to ask it when we get to our question and answer period. I do want to say we were overwhelmed. We had nearly 100 people RSVP for our second gathering and many of you submitted your questions ahead of time, which is wonderful. So Alberto, Dr. Cerulli, as well as David Winkler, will introduce when we get to our uh, question portion of this gathering. We've actually gone through all of the questions. Unfortunately, we're not gonna get to every single one during this gathering because we had nearly 30, <laughs> which is wonderful. But uh, we will be responding to you after this gathering and we will answer your questions as well. Your questions are going to shape future research gatherings that we have. We will be picking the topics based off of the questions that you sent us, so thank you. So without further ado, let's get started. I wanna introduce Dr. Alberto Hayek, our president, um, and we also call him our chief scientific advisor. He is the head of all of the brilliance that we have, and he's going to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Cerulli. Thank you. Uh, is it Great pleasure to introduce Dr. Vincenzo Cirulli. He's a wonderful friend of mine, a distinguished scientist. He has spent most of his professional life initially studying the development of the human fetal pancreas. And all that knowledge that he generated has been applied now to stem cells and the issue of type 1 diabetes. So Vincenzo, please tell us about your work. All right, thank you. Let me uh, share my screen. Uh, can you all see this? Uh, yes. All right. All right, okay, let me get started. First of all, thanks for this opportunity to share some of our most recent work. Uh, I put up this slide, uh, just to convey uh, the mes message that although I am a, an endocrinologist and I could be uh, taking care of patients and make a lot of money right now, uh, my true passion has been since the, very, since the very beginning to study basic mechanisms on how islet cells work and how they produce, develop and produce insulin. This used to be my plate uh, when I was at UCSD in California. Uh, I really love the islets, as you can see. Uh, I spent 17 years uh, in La Jolla, first training as a senior fellow with Alberto, and then uh, uh, building up my own team. And in 2009, I moved to the University of Washington here in Seattle, where I have been since. All right, so what I'm going to uh, share with you today is uh, the uh, some of the findings uh, that we have uh, uh, been able to uh, uh, put together with the help of some fellows and some uh, grad students on how cells talk to one another and how this mechanism help us make better protocols, improve protocols for the uh, production of, of uh, insulin producing cells from so-called stem cells or pluripotent stem cells. This is a really brief outline of what I'm going to share with you 
Uh, first, I will touch on a uh, series of uh, experiments that uh, a really talented grad student supported by the DRC uh, conducted over the past uh, few years. And uh, it's focusing on a mechanism of cell-cell communication in uh, processes of uh, differentiation of islet cells from stem cells. And later I will tell you about some new findings that are unpublished on uh, how we can exploit these uh, uh, mechanisms, these lessons that we learned from the developing pancreas to actually apply them again to adult human islets and make more of these cells to be used for transplantation. As you know, there is a shortage of uh, uh, human islets for transplantation. So we either make new beta cells from stem cells or we expand whatever islet cells we can gather from organ donors. With that, let's move on to the first uh, series of slides. And this is a brief introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with what the pancreas is. It's this, lead, this organ uh, that sits just underneath your stomach. And if you were to make sections of it, you will find that uh, a small component of this large mass uh, is actually uh, composed of so-called uh, pancreatic islets, these clusters here that are dispersed throughout the uh, exocrine uh, tissue through, throughout the old pancreas. They are randomly distributed. And uh, what they, they are responsible for are, is the production of glucagon and insulin. They are highly vascularized. As opposed to the acinar tissue, they produce juice that will contribute to the digestion of food stuff, of, of food stuff that uh, uh, into the lumen of the bank, of, of the gut here. So uh, if you were to take a cross section of the pancreas, this is what the islet will look like, are these clear looking clusters of cells. You can color them with different antibodies. Um, here we have uh, some antibodies that are specific for uh, beta cells. Uh, and uh, in green here, you'll see beta cells in red, this is a factor that is in the nucleus of the, of the beta cells. It's called MAFE. Um, and uh, they're just beautiful clusters, which tells you how uh, packed they are with each other, uh, uh, scattered throughout the rest of the, of the gland of the pancreas. Uh, this, is, uh, this is work when I was training in uh, Switzerland before coming to the US in 93. Um, and this is a, a rodent islet. Human islets look about the same. They are really uh, tight clusters of cells attached to each other. And these black holes that you see here are, uh, is what is left after we isolated them and removed the blood vessels. Um, and if you were to dissociate into a single cell suspension, these large clusters, this is what the single beta cell will look like which incidentally as, uh, is already telling us how intimate are the relationship that each cell uh, entertain with its neighbor and in these large clusters here. And so since the very beginning when I was a fellow, uh, my passion has been to find out why is it that they cluster together and what are the, the, the molecules that are responsible for this uh, aggregation. And we can uh, summarize them in two large uh, families. Uh, one family that we call cell-cell adhesion molecules or sticky proteins, how you want to call them. Uh, and another class that is called cell matrix uh, proteins of the integrin family. Uh, so these are all uh, proteins that allow to, uh, uh, for cells to interact with each other. And this is, in this cartoon here, I oversimplified the, the notion that Islets are really a small community of cells. If you think that each of these uh, individuals here is a cell, the cell has uh, different ways of interacting with each other, either through holding hands, and this would be what we call cell-to-cell -cell interaction, or they can interact with the environment, which would be the ground, where they stand, use their legs to stand on the matrix, or what we call matrix actually is whatever is outside the cell, okay? 
and, and each individual actually interact all the time with its environment, whether that be a cell uh, or uh, a matrix that is uh, exposed to them. So uh, moving on, I just want to give you a brief introduction on how we end up making a pancreas during development. Uh, this is uh, work from the rodents, from mice, but you can think of uh, uh, relating this uh, to human uh, pancreas development, if you just replace these numbers, which, which incidentally are days, okay? So in mice, islets develop from uh, start early on, the pancreas as a little bud, and then eventually uh, branch out, and uh, the red dots here are the islet cells, and the P0 is at, at basically at 21 days of gestation, would correspond in human at about 39 and a half weeks. So pretty much those are the stages of uh, islet development that apply to rodents and uh, human with a few differences. Um, so if you look at the mechanistics, uh, uh, the way these things happen is that during development, you have a domain, a group of cells here in yellow that will give rise to either the acinar cells, which we don't care about. Those are the ones that produce enzymes that allow you to digest your food stuff. And these green cells here that which detach, migrate out in the surrounding matrix, and they cluster together and form these large clusters that we call uh, islets. Uh, so now, what are the challenges really to make new beta cells from stem cells? So uh, there are a number, but I would uh, uh, summarize them briefly into three uh, categories. The first challenge is how you shrink is a 29, 39 weeks gestation into about the three weeks, two to three weeks in a Petri dish. Uh, this is a real challenge in the field. And that's why so far, even though you can read in the news and in scientific uh, reports that uh, we are almost there, uh, 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 the stage of testing these cells in the clinic, honestly, I don't think we are quite there yet because at best, after three weeks of uh, uh, manipulation in a Petri dish, we only about get, at best, maybe 20 to 30% of cells that express and produce insulin. So we need to do a better job at that. That's why, so far, there hasn't been a single uh, uh, published study in which uh, there has been a, a transplantation of the stem cell-derived beta cells. But slowly, we are getting there. Then the next challenge is heterogeneity, and that relates to what just I said, uh, which means that at the end of this procedure, only about a third or so of the cells are the cells that we want. The, the third challenge uh, that a number of investigators are addressing is the so-called functional immaturity. So we can make cells that produce insulin, but it doesn't mean that they actually respond to glucose to uh, take care of, those, of uh, the hyperglycemia in a diabetic uh, animal or in a diabetic patient. So those are the, the, some of the challenges. And let me tell you now what we've been trying to do, which is focus early on, step back, and see if we can make a better job on making the, the, the cells that we need. So this is the first stage here, what we call definitive endowment. It's a bunch of cells that will give rise to the pancreatic cells. And we need to make a good number of them before we can reach a point of turning this 15% into close to 100%. Uh, now, one of the molecules that has been a really uh, one of the focus of uh, my research throughout the years uh, are molecules that uh, regulate the buildup of these uh, special uh, channels or tunnels that uh, are basically uh, a vehicle of cell-to-cell -cell communication. Uh, we can uh, refer to them as a sort of a highway of uh, speedy communication. In other, cell, in other words, if the cell number one in touch with the cell number two need to exchange a message rapidly, rather than uh, releasing a factor in the surrounding environment and then wait for the cell to pick it up, they have this highway to open this channel basically and exchange a number of uh, factors that can tell cell one or cell two what they want to do collectively as a society. And that's what happens all the time during development in different tissues. So uh, 
you don't need to actually uh, read all of this, but all I want to point, point out that during my trainings about 27, 30 years ago now, we found uh, together with uh, Paolo Mida and uh, Orchi, my, uh, two of my mentors, that connexin 43, one of these protein that makes up this channel, channels, is important for this pancreatic itis immature cells to form. And later, in adult beta cells, this other one is important. So these are the two main proteins that we need to care about if we want to make better uh, beta cells from stem cells. And uh, so how did we, do we study this? Uh, very recently, what we used is an assay that is called uh, spontaneous differentiation of stem cells into embryoid bodies. What embryoid bodies are, are basically these large clusters that one can form over five days uh, by taking up stem cells, which grow usually as a flat sheets of cells, monolayers, then we cluster together, they, we cluster them together and let them grow. Uh, this uh, assay allow us to determine how good of a stem cell is, meaning can they make every single cell in the body? And to do that, they have to be able to make these three cell lineages, or these three cell types. One of them is mesoderm, will give rise to heart cells or muscle, ectoderm, which makes up uh, your skin and your brain, and definitive endoderm. This is the type of cells that we need to make pancreatic cells. So if you take some of these clusters here, and now, and you cut them into small slices and color them with a colored antibody for different factors, what we discovered is that this protein that I just told you about, connexin 43 here, which makes up those uh, channels that allow cells to talk to one another, uh, it's highly enriched in group of cells here, this red spot is the connexin 43, group of cells that produce this green protein here, which is called SOC17. Now, this is really important. If you don't have this, you're not gonna make any definitive endoderm cells, and you're not gonna make it any pancreatic cells. So this was really uh, exciting for us to find that this protein is so incredibly enriched only in these cells and not in the others. So at this point, uh, we tested some of the current protocols that are being used in the field, and we uh, put cells in a Petri dish, treating them with different factors. And uh, so this is the type of uh, steps, stages that cells undergo uh, uh, to uh, produce endocrine progenitors that eventually will make insulin producing cells. And uh, to do that, uh, basically, uh, we analyzed all stages for the production of this protein, connexin 43. And what was astonishing to us is that during the first three stages, these early stages, which include this famous group of cells that I told you is really important to make pancreatic cells, is highly produced, and then drops down, meaning that maybe afterwards is no longer needed. So to test that, what we did, uh, we use a technique that is, uh, allows us to uh, block the production of this connexin 43. Uh, this technique called uh, us the RNA interference, or SI RNA for short. Basically, we put a substance that basically allow uh, the, the cell to stop making this. And as you can see, these are the cells we, we, that we want under control condition, where there is basically no treatment. And this is the number of cells that we get when we block the production. You see, you go from a third of all down to about 10 to 12%. So visibly, if we take this protein out, we no longer make the cells of interest to us. And we validated that with a different cell line that we generated here a few years ago. It's a better line because instead of making only about a third of the cells, which are the good guys that we want, we make about 60%. So when we decrease the production of this protein, connexin 43, in these cells, we no longer get 60%, but barely 40%. So that is a sort of a, a negative experiment, but it tells us that this is a critical, important 
uh, protein to make the cells that we need. So next, the obvious experiment was how do we increase uh, the, the function of this protein to make sure that now, if it is so important, uh, we can actually uh, see what happens when we let the cells uh, talk to each other more often. And uh, we used a, pro a, a small peptide, a, small, a piece of a protein, that's what a peptide is, that what it does, it keeps these channels open all the time when you apply it to stem cells, okay? And in doing so, what we noticed is that now we start to make a lot of, remember that SOC17 that I showed you before, that those green cells? Now we made a lot of this protein as we do a lot of these other protein. So the orange bar here compared to the blue one tells you that when we treat with the, this peptide, the stem cells, we make a lot more of the good guys, the one that the cells that we want to make these endocrine progenitors. And uh, here is just a quantification of what I just said, They're using the different techniques that we call Western blooding. You see when plus means that the peptide has been added to the stem cells, minus means that there was no peptide, you see how darker is the spot. That means that there is a lot more of this FOXA2 than in the control. Same here, same for SOC17, a lot more when we add the peptide. So that's very exciting because it tells us that we are actually doing, telling the cell to keep on talking to each other and exchange whatever message they like to exchange to, 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 to grow towards uh, pancreas, the pancreatic phenotype pancreatic cell type. And uh, this is, these are the numbers. You see, we move on when we use the peptide. It, each dot here is a cell. So these are the good guys, the cells that we want, okay? And uh, when we treat with the peptide, we go from 39 to 64%, so a lot more. And this is just a, a measure uh, uh, normalized to zero that would be the control. So basically, over time, at day two, we have almost a two-fold increase in the number of the cells that we want. By day three, we make four times more of these cells, which is really exciting because eventually, as we reach the end of this protocol, you see in this slide, when we color the cells for these other two proteins, PDX, that is a marker of progenitors, um, and SOX9 and NKX 6.1 together with PDX. You see on the right side, you have a lot more yellow cells, meaning that produce both of these proteins as opposed to the control where, yeah, you have some orange and yellow cells, but not as many. And we counted this in a number of experiments. And the bottom line, just focus on this last bar here. You see that compared to current protocol where you get about 8% uh, of the cells, uh, that are actually the good guys that we want, we go up to 35%. So that is an incredible increase in the number of cells that we want to make more beta cells from stem cells. So uh, with that, we can conclude that promoting this crosstalk, this gap junction mediated cell-to-cell uh, -cell communication with this peptide, we are enhancing the ability of stem cells to go to become a pancreatic progenitors. And so now what we are doing, following these uh, earlier studies, uh, we are testing if these cells now can actually become a mature insulin producing cells. And uh, these are experiments that are cooking. We transplanted a number of um, mice with these cells and uh, by 12 weeks, we'll know if they make more insulin or if they have more insulin producing cells than their counterpart controls, which did not receive the treatment of this uh, special peptide. And then of course, uh, uh, the golden grail question here is, uh, we know that we are increasing the ability of these cells to talk to one another, but we don't know what they are talking about. So basically we don't know what are the signals that are exchanged from one cell to another. And this is something that is ongoing and we hope to find a, 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 an answer in the near future, because if we know, then we could also use those signals directly on the cells to make better beta cells from stem cells. So now um, I'm switching here to a somewhat related topic, but um, uh, using human adult habits. 
as I alluded earlier on uh, during uh, the beginning of my presentation, one of the tasks in um, trying to uh, achieve um, uh, normal glycemia in patients with diabetes is to transplant insulin producing cells. The problem of using human islets is that there is never going to be nearly enough islets, human islets from organ donors to cure all the diabetic patients that are eligible to receive such a treatment. So it, uh, our lab, like many other labs, and uh, uh, Alberto's, uh, Dr. Ayek's lab, actually is one of the first labs that started to uh, explore ways of increasing uh, human islet's ability to respond to growth factors and uh, replicate increasing numbers. Uh, over the years, uh, a number of labs have tried to figure out how to do that. So um, this will focus basically now on these special group of proteins that we call cadherins, okay? And some signals that are downstream uh, of this uh, signal of these uh, proteins. Think of this uh, as addition molecules between different uh, uh, individuals. And depending on whether you, uh, you are holding your hands tightly to with your neighbors or you're just barely touching the fingers, the fingers, you are basically exchanging different messages to your neighbor. That's what cells do all the time. And so this is a, in this cartoon, I just want to oversimplify further the complexity of the system, just to convey the message that usually, uh, if you have two cells here, this yellow box is one cell and this other yellow box here is another cell, they are, interacting with each other with these blue roads here, which are the cadherins, okay? But downstream, inside the cells, these cadherins uh, recruit a number of, interact with a number of other proteins. Here, ex exemplified, you have uh, some uh, proteins that we call a beta here, beta catenin, that actually represent like a, a green light for cells to go on and proliferate. But the alpha do the opposite. You see, it actually blocks it's a, like a red light here, blocks these cells to go on and replicate, increase in number. And it does that through blocking many different pathways. This one is called MAP kinase. It doesn't matter, you don't have to remember this, but basically this is just to depict, depict the, notion, the notion that these alpha cells, uh, these alpha molecules are blockers of cells, of beta cells to respond to growth stimuli. So, uh, what we did, we asked the question, what, uh, what if we now reduce the production of this protein in human adult islets? Can we now turn these red lights into green lights? So think of this alpha, another simple example I can give you. Uh, think of this alpha uh, molecule as the parking brake in your car. If you have your parking brakes on, you can push the car, but it's not gonna move. If you release the parking brake on your car, then you push the car and it will move. That's exactly what I mean by turning this blockade into a stimulus. And we do that, we did that. So we treat it as a control situation in a Petri dish. We treated human islets with different factors and you see that no treatment, you occasionally see one cell here marked with this red dot that is proliferating, meaning it's replicating. If you add this factor, instead of one, you have two or three cells. If this other factor also about two or three cells. This other factor here, three, four, five cells or so. If we now do what I just tell you, told you, meaning we release that break by reducing that alpha catenin protein, Look what happened. And down here, you have a quantification of these events, okay? So no treatment, just a no treatment, just a releasing the breaks. You have more cells that are entering uh, the replic a replication state. If you put this factor here, we, you make about twice. So you do with this other factor and with this factor. So basically this factor, that was the factor identified by Dr. Andy Stewart, um, a few years ago, uh, this is, oops, my presentation got stuck. Don't know what happened. 
sorry, I have to probably restart. I don't know what happened. Can you hear me okay? My presentation got stuck. I don't know what happened. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I'll try to restart it briefly, okay? I'm sorry for this. Okay, well, while Vincenzo is um, restarting, I think he left uh, temporarily. He will be back shortly. Um, we did We did have several questions. I think there's one um, that, let me make um, Alberto, Dr. Hayek. I'm gonna bring him in. Okay, Alberto, we can hear you. Can you just briefly, for those that are listening in, can you just share um, briefly what this new research that Dr. Cerulli just shared with us means to those living with type one? Did we rehearse that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, but anyway, the, uh, one of the problems that we have today in trying to uh, make uh, stem cells that are viable and produce insulin and cure uh, diabetes is that we have a lot of protocols that take these stem cells into whatever organ one prefers. In our case, in diabetes, trying to make uh, insulin producing cells. Since there are so many protocols, uh, okay, no, I'm you, back. Oh, here it is. Here is me. Right. Sorry. Yeah, so just a couple of words to close my statement. So Vincenzo's work is centered into finding ways to increase the number of insulin producing cells that come out of these uh, protocols for uh, differentiated or taking undifferentiated stem cells into insulin producing cells. Okay, Vincenzo. All right. Sorry for the interruption. Can you hear, hear me? Vincenzo, you have to start your video. Okay. All right, let's see. Uh, it's on the bottom left. Yeah. There you go. All right. Okay, it's back. Back, all right. I apologize for the interruption, courtesy of our Wi-Fi at the University of Washington. Anyway, as I was saying, uh, basically by, uh, reducing the level of this, the production of this protein up here, we are now increasing the ability of uh, beta cell, human beta cells to respond to growth yeah. stimuli. And uh, we were also able to take these cells, cluster them together, and within 12 days, they made these beautiful clusters that eventually we transplanted in mice in the lower part here, compared to the higher uh, part here. And what is really important, uh, I would like you to notice that these cells are better performers than the control ones. You see, they make up to 1400 picomole of human C-peptide, which is a surrogate for measuring uh, human insulin, as opposed to 800. So these are functional cells that we previously expanded in a Petri dish and now put in an animal. And so with that, I think what this experiment demonstrate is that by reducing alpha catenin, we are transiently removing the breaks from the cell cycle. And now cells can proliferate, respond to growth factors. And then uh, since this is a procedure that is self-extinguishing because the cells can mute these reagents, can get rid of it after about a week, 
then we restore the brakes on the cell cycle. And now these are fully functional uh, beta cells. So this is a procedure that is very uh, promising and exciting to us because it doesn't involve any genetic manipulation. It's just a reagent that you put to the cell, on the cell, Petri dish, and then you can expand them within a week or two weeks and then use them for transplantation. And uh, with that, I just want to uh, mention the people that did most of the work. Uh, Wendy Young uh, was a grad student in my lab. Uh, she graduated about two years ago and she did so thanks to the generous support of the Diabetes Research Connection. And uh, the names in yellow here are people that have made a various contribution to the project. Um, and of course, I would like to acknowledge uh, support from uh, other sources like uh, the Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine that we call Ice Cream, the Joanna Diabetes Foundation, and the uh, NIH. And I would like to spend a moment to uh, expand really on what the Diabetes Research Connection uh, uh, what an impact they had uh, in uh, supporting this project. Um, this is Wendy. Uh, Wendy received a $50,000 uh, support uh, from the DRC that led us uh, uh, to uh, gather um, uh, graduated uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, she published her work in this uh, uh, paper that is, as of today, uh, published just in September, has received uh, uh, numerous citations. Uh, but uh, what really is even more impactful uh, than just the, 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 the help on one uh, young uh, trainee is really uh, this little investment, if I dare to call it little, because research is very expensive, has really snowballed into larger programs because some of the data that uh, Wendy produced uh, re, uh, were used for the preliminary proof of principle to get to this new award uh, funded by the JDRF, a half a million dollars grant that started last year. And then recently, at the beginning of April, uh, we received a, a new R01 award that focus precisely on these mechanisms of a cell to cell interaction. Uh, this is a project that uh, is gonna go on uh, for about uh, four years. Uh, and just very recently, at the beginning of May, uh, we received a, a second R01. This is an R01 in collaboration with the laboratory of uh, Dr. Laura Crisa, who is the lead uh, investigator in this uh, multi investigator award and uh, together with my lab and with uh, Cole De Forest, a young investigator here at the University of Washington, uh, who is a bioengineer. And this is a project that is really important that relates um, not only to the relevance of stem cells, but also to that of the relevance of human adult islets, because it focuses on the mechanisms of uh, producing stem cell derived beta cells and then shielding them from the immune system such that Number one, they get accepted by the immune system of the transplant recipient, but also engraft much better by promoting uh, uh, angiogenesis, what we call engraftment by angiogenesis. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I will uh, take uh, some of the questions, uh, and I thank you for your attention. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Cerulli. If you can please stop sharing your screen. Okay. Okay, great, thank you so much. Let me get you on here with your video. Um, Vincenzo, if you can start your video, that would be great. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. So we don't have um, much time to answer as many questions as we received, but there is one that I do. Uh, Dr. Hayek, Alberto, you, you started to answer it. Uh, Vincenzo, maybe you can help. But it, it, it is, so what does all of this research mean to those living with type 1? 
uh, well, what it means, uh, you know, I get uh, asked this question all the time, and uh, often uh, it's very difficult to, to put a timetable on what this does means in terms of being able to put these cells in people next week or next year or in uh, five years. So I think what is really important, and, and I have uh, members of, uh, in uh, my extended family with diabetes, I tell that uh, to them all the time. Insulin, think of insulin uh, discovery in the 20s, 1920s. Look how far we came across in the past uh, 80, 90 years. It's huge. So today you live with diabetes with some discomfort, with some uh, drawbacks, but nonetheless, you live a, a close to normal life. In the 20s, was almost a death sen a sentence. Basically, they would starve these kids to prevent the hyperglycemia, to push them into a coma. So I think that what is really important to remember is that research is important to understand and uh, uh, what are all the complexity uh, that we need to uh, understand and address to make better cells for transplantation. And every step of the way, uh, some of those have been put, uh, some of those discoveries have been put into practice. So we have be better insulin today, we have pumps, we have continuous monitoring uh, systems, and so on and so forth. So, and I think that with the expertise, with the experience of the eye transplantation that has started quite a, a couple of decades ago, you know that a new season is coming soon with possibly with stem cell derived uh, beta cells will, that will enjoy a, a, a theoretically an unlimited source. But first and foremost, we need to make sure that what we produce in a Petri dish is safe. So I would uh, advise, uh, uh, often in the media we read all sorts of things, and there are a lot of companies and so-called private clinics that advertise miraculous cures with stem cells. So beware of those, because stem cells need to be saved before they can be used in people. And I think that we are all, as a scientific community, we are all making small contributions, and each step at a time it will get there. I'm confident, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this. As I said earlier, I don't do this for a paycheck because if it was for the money, I would be doing, uh, I would be a clinician, but I do this because I uh, have an investment uh, on it. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Cerulli. Um, we will get back to you with answers to your questions. I'm sorry we didn't have more time, but as we close, um, our two co-founders are with us, David Winkler and Dr. Alberto Hayek. Uh, do either of you have anything to add? Yeah, I'd like to, to uh, first of all, thank Vincenzo for a great talk. As I'm sure our audience could tell, it's complicated. And uh, these steps are critical to provide a large supply of fully functioning islet cells so that Ultimately, we end up with a biologic cure because as good as the mechanics are, even of looping, which I strongly advocate anyone to get involved in the feedback loop of the continuous glucose meter to the pump, ultimately, we need a biologic cure. And so I thank you for your huge effort in that arena. And what impresses me more than anything is the investment that DRC made in your laboratory because for $50,000, um, if I add the numbers up right, it, it, we have precipitated a total of $4.5 million in follow-on grants uh, from JDRF and NIH, which was exactly the model that we had hoped for is via our 80 member scientific review committee headed by Dr. Hayek and, and others on our board. They pick out the best research and clearly this is some of the best research. Uh, four of our researchers have gotten over a million dollars in follow on money. And so all I can tell to our audience is in addition to the important science that's being done is that investing in DRC is a good thing with, a, with an amazing rate of return. So we 
appreciate all of our supporters that are out there and um, want to assure you that we will get to your questions. There will be more great seminars to um, talk about everything from care to some of the other developments in uh, NHR. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and close and I just want to reintroduce Casey Davis, our Director of Development, and she just has a few closing remarks and um, from, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for joining us and continuing to support all the work that DRC does. Yeah, so thank you everyone for joining. Um, David said it well as I wanted to repeat that we really couldn't do what we do at DRC without generous supporters and many of you were listening in today. So we wanna thank you for your generosity and your partnership. Um, yeah, we're so grateful for you. So we are excited to keep offering these virtual events, but we need your help. We need to know what you wanna hear. So I will be sending an email shortly, just thanking you for attending, um, a couple other links that you can check out and I will include in there um, if you would like to respond to me directly and, and tell me a specific topic, a question that you would like to see a future virtual event um, crafted around, we wanna do that with you and for you. So um, thank you again. And we will also share some information about, we have these virtual events and our annual fundraising event is also going virtual. We're very excited about it. Um, so stay tuned for more details. And in the email I send, you can sign up for our e-newsletter. That will include any updates we have on research, DRC news and events as well. So thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you guys soon. Bye.